welcome once again to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. As you are aware, these lectures are being brought to you by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. We are in module 1 of this series of lectures on English language and literature. Um, I would like to remind you once again that these lectures or the target audience um, for these lectures are students in various engineering colleges in IITs, NITs etcetera uh, for whom a certain degree of knowledge and skill in the in English language is a requirement. We have tried to offer various aspects of the English language and literature with a hope that students even if they belong to the engineering disciplines will be acquainted with very interesting aspects for in say for instance of the different um, literary theories and critical tools that we in the humanities employ to understand uh, literature and also language uh, aspects of the various uh, periods in English language and literature say the age of Milton, the Augustan age, the Shakespeare's age etcetera. Right? So, let me first begin with a recap of the last lecture and you will recall that the last lecture was, was about the scope of English studies and in uh, the very first lecture of this series uh, in the lecture, the introductory lecture, we had given an explanation as to why even though this course is entitled English language and literature, English studies is another topic that could well be you know um, applied to it. There ha have been a lot of a number of changes over uh, so many years. Okay, regarding the study of English language and literature. And with that um, you know uh, aim in view, we had uh, devoted the last lecture to talking about the scope of English studies. Right? So, uh, let me do a quick recap about you know regarding the uh, or of the last lecture. Well, we saw in the last lecture that uh, you know if you were to summarize Right, or if you were to point out uh, say three or four important areas in uh, that you would first you know and talk about first or things that come to your mind immediately when we talk about English studies right. We could uh, zoom in on three areas and these would be and this is in random order really it is not that if I talk about one first that it is the most important um, literatures in English, English linguistics and English sociolinguistics. Okay. These are the three areas that you would have to talk about first or that a teacher would have to talk about first when she is talking to you about English studies. Well, yet we saw that there are other you know important areas which sort of enhance the scope of English studies uh, which we would definitely have to talk about after having spoken about the English language, um, literature and um, uh, sociolinguistics. Right? And these are you would recall these would or the scope would enlarge itself to embrace issues in journalism right? as far as English studies is concerned, the use of English language is concerned, uh, the philosophy of language in general. Okay? Uh, literary theory and criticism, creative writing, the domain of publishing, particularly contemporary electronic publishing and texts, film and media. If you look at these, we saw in the last lecture that these are by no means areas that you could uh, leave out when you talk about the scope of English studies. Then we found that there is a difference when you talk about English language and literature and English studies in the sense that English studies would uh, include importantly uh, you know tools, methods and knowledge regarding proficiency in English speaking and writing. Okay? And for that you have uh, English 
uh, for special purposes, the use of English for instance for business purposes okay. uh, and very importantly the use of English as a second language and now of course, also as a third language right. So, we find that these, these are, not, are not areas that we cover in our uh, lectures, because there is a lot that we you know uh, we have to do within uh, the boundaries of 40 lectures right. But in the last lecture we did see that English studies has, in, has increasingly today come to replace English language and literature, though of course, for this uh, for the purposes of the cur uh, current course we are um, reverting back to the more traditional English language and literature as a title. And finally, the focus as far as English studies is concerned is also on global dissemination. The global dissemination not only of the English language in its everyday use, in its use in business etcetera, but also okay, uh, the global dissemination of literatures in English. Okay. And uh, we uh, talk about this fact or this phenomenon or tendency in a couple of our lectures. Okay. So, this is uh, a brief recap of if you have forgotten some of these points you may go back to lecture number 2 in this module. Right? So, well let us now come to our uh, uh, topic or the topic of discussion today. The topic of discussion today really is the English language. Okay? Uh, a bit about what how we are going to go about it in a while, but let me first um, talk about some of or refer to some of the texts and reference books that you may want to have a look at. And as you know, when you talk about the English language, there is really a plethora of texts of references on encyclo very, very excellent encyclopedias on the English language, and you would. Uh, uh, or you would realize that it is impossible for us to bring these uh, all of these into our lectures. Nevertheless, let me point to some of the books that may be readily available and this is really a mixture of books that traditionally have been there almost canonized in uh, any uh, you know um, course or syllabus on English literature. For instance, uh, this book Simeon Potter. Uh, Charles Barber, these books, A. C. Ball definitely, these are books that uh, most of us have read okay, uh, during um, our training in uh, English studies or English language and literature courses, both in the uh, honors courses, major courses and in the general courses. Let me quickly run through the list. For instance, you have an, a very important and uh, informative uh, Routledge Dictionary of Language and Linguistics. Okay. Uh, then Tom MacArthur, he also features in our lecture here um, through his book that is the Oxford Companion to the English language and as I said Simeon Potter's uh, excellent in you know uh, excellently written I would say one, one of my favorite uh, texts here is Our Language, Charles Barber's The English Language A Historical Introduction, A. C. Ball's A History of the English Language. Uh, you may also look at creative writers who have written about the English language. For instance, George Orwell's The English Language is an a, a, you know, important essay in and now it is in uh, Indrani Ghosh's edited book History of English Language, A Critical Companion. Uh, his again a polemical essay Politics and the English Language published in 1946, which is readily available in uh, the internet. Raymond Williams is the growth of standard English and look at this quote unquote standard okay, standard English. Some of you would be aware of Raymond Williams's reputation and stature as a very important uh, Marxist critic and his analysis of class in the use of language. So, Raymond Williams is this, the growth of standard English again included uh, in Indrani Ghosh's edited book. Uh, also elements of sexism, okay, elements of sexism in the English language. Uh, this has been pointed out by uh, Ethel Strangehams in our sexist language in uh, the history, sorry, should be quotation marks here, the history 
in the history of English language, a critical companion again edited by Indrani Ghosh. Okay. So, um, my point here to bring you know in bringing to you this um, really random collection of uh, titles here is also to show you the different ways in which we talk about the English language. Okay. When we talk about the English language at this level and by this level I mean uh, it is not really a level when you first talk about and you get introduced to the English language, you are using the English language. Okay. Uh, you are many of you are proficient in the use of this language both in reading and writing. At this stage we are also not looking only at the history of English language. When we talk about the English language per se, we are expected to also uh, know various you know at least some of the different aspects of language in general and you know uh, a particular language in this case uh, English okay, with us and uh, you know what also to be aware at least of what the different aspects of the English language may be. For instance, many of us are not aware unless it is brought to us by a critic that there is an element of sexism in the English language or that there, there are very important um, you know pointers to the subtle workings of class for instance in the English language. So, uh, let me say at the beginning uh, uh, you know uh, right away that this lecture first is cannot is and cannot be an exhaustive lecture or discussion or about the English language. Nobody can do it really in uh, within the constraints of an hour. What I am going to do here is first tell you some facts about the English language. Okay. For instance, uh, which um, you know language group it belongs to and uh, whether how it has developed and you know uh, what are the different phases when we talk about historically about the English language and that is something that you begin with. But you also go on what I am going to do is the writers that I have mentioned here at least some of them I am going to bring to you some of the points that they have raise, raised about the English language and again these critical so called you know uh, uh, critical points are again not exhaustive. You will have a number of uh, critics talking about uh, you know uh, different political issues. Okay. For instance, books like the politics of the English language for instance, okay, talking about the politics of the English language, you can have separate lectures on this. So, please treat this as a very general lecture with some critical insights. Well, if you are asked where does English come from, where did English come from in the sense that how was English, Eng the English language born, right? the English language as we know it today. Uh, and for that matter any any language goes through a number of developments, a number of changes that are not intrinsic, they are related to external events, they are related to wars, they are related to political decisions, they are related to the social life, okay, to economics. right? Uh, so, if you are asked uh, where did the English language come from, then you would say that English, the English language is uh, or it comes from the West Germanic uh, group, let us say, okay, the West Germanic group and uh, it is it comes eventually from the Anglo Frisian dialects, more about this in a while. So, if you really have to place it okay, in, uh, in, a ling in a language group, then you would say that English is an, in, is an Indo European language okay, belonging to the West Germanic uh, branch of Indo European okay, and it is uh, formed by certain Anglo Frisian dialects fine. Further again we talk about facts about the English language. Um, these facts may change of course, from even year to year, but uh, if you take an average uh, it is and this I have taken from uh, you know one of the sources in uh, you know uh, reliable sources on the internet. Uh, it is the official language in 51 countries. Next the substance uh, in 104 countries right there are a substantial number of or, or there are substantial native english speakers okay so first we have the being the official language in 51 countries then in an, in we saw that in uh, in 104 countries there are substantial english uh, speakers or native english speakers then further 
if you look at the most you know uh, if you uh, english is not really the most spoken language right mandarin chinese is the most spoken language in the world and english occupies the third position right so in terms of the uh, you know the use of the language it is it, uh, uh, it is a, uh, it occupies play, uh, num the third position okay and here uh, we are not talking of only english uh, being used as a you know native by native speakers right there are more than 600 million people who use the english language okay we can look at this number six more than 600 million people use the english language as second or third language do you follow okay so if for instance if your native language is not english or your mother tongue is not english you nevertheless in my case my mother tongue is assamese but i am using english and uh, even though it, it is more or less you know many would say that it is uh, almost like a mother tongue to me since i am a, uh, you know I, i teach english but the fact here is that as a second language or as a third even as a third language if you look at the the number of people who use english it is more than 600 million in the world now what was the question that we posed in the beginning where does english or where did english come from okay we have a whole module in in fact module uh, i think the second module if i'm not mistaken is develop is sorry dedicated to the history of uh, the english language okay so in that module we have about five or six lectures where we talk about the beginnings of the english language right down to its contemporary use and we see how it has developed over the ages and there we will talk about this a bit more in detail but uh, suffice it for us here now as a way of introducing the english language to say that uh, the english language uh, comes after the marauding tribes from uh, you know uh, europe the angles the saxons and the jutes right uh, they uh, they invaded uh, england and the english that began the language that began there and re replaced particularly celtic right uh, was the language that eventually became english right we look at the word angles and you see the similarity here okay angles from uh, the word england for instance is supposed to have come from angles uh, where we have anglerland or sometimes anglerland okay and eventually to england right so you see that see the similarity or you see the root of this word right so these uh, dialects anglo saxons and jutes eventually uh, gave rise to english but then english as you know even in the common sensical way is you know what many people say call a borrowing language it's actually a term in, in language studies called a borrowing language there are several words uh, and here really the 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 almost the political question of purity okay purity and impurity of language is something that that uh, somebody might raise here <coughs> and english is a language that i would say forget the words like purity and impurity is a language that has been able to accommodate okay and that is why it is uh, one of the most living languages in the world okay it's been able to accommodate changes accommodate our words from as you shall see in, in detail in the next module words from other languages like french for instance right so what what uh, we saw uh, here is that english um, and the word Eng uh, england and eventually england um, its roots can be traced back to the angles right now okay so we found that the, uh, with the coming of these marauding tribes and the growth of a different language right the celts the the celtic language began to be used uh, you know um, in scot areas like scotland wales in areas uh, in areas of cornwall for instance even now in the present time you find uh, you know uh, you find uh, certain populations in these places you know uh, deliberately or very consciously even even consciously okay uh, trying to revive and at least to keep Uh, the celtic language uh, the alive okay so for instance the celtic influence now let's look at these see the Kel the place certain important place names are celtic in origin for instance london york 
kent or for instance kent from kanti meaning unknown and uh, the Celtic words like come a uh, deep valley in names uh, for instance in names like duncombe, tor or a high rock for instance in tor hill, tor, tor cross etcetera. Even the Thames right you have Celtic river names like the Thames, um, Evan, uh, Dover etcetera and also other Celtic loan words are referred to here by uh, linguists like bin, basket or crib, brook, come again tor etcetera. Okay. So, you find that it is not that a language that replaced everything and sort of you know destroyed all other languages, it, ha it is made up of and if you look at the scan you know, later on the Scandinavian uh, influence, the French influence etcetera, the influence even from colonies you will find that the English language is a language which has been able to accommodate and absorb so to speak okay? uh, not just words not just vocabulary, but also uh, you know certain phrases and ways of expression. Right? So, uh, to sum up this part of our lecture your uh, uh, English belongs to the Indo-European family, okay? it is related to many languages in Europe, Western Asia, Australia, New Zealand. North and South America and parts of Africa and languages related to English derive and descend from a common parent language as Indo-European, Indo-Germanic or Aryan. Right? So, um, these when, remember we talked about you know the development of uh, the English language and changes over the years owing to political reasons, uh, to social reasons, to socio-economic reasons and we usually divide uh, the uh, history of the English language into three phases. Right? Uh, nowadays, we also talk about the uh, fourth phase, but generally we talk about three phases and these are um, Old English, Middle English and Modern English and you can see the dates here more about it. I am not going to go into this at all here more about it later, but again you see how uh, you know we will see the different aspects of these uh, you know languages later on in those lectures. And for now suffice it to talk about uh, the different phases as old, middle and modern English. Now, when you talk about now, now we, are, we are we are leaving the factual you know, the so called factual part of it when talk about when we had we talked about the number of people who use the English language as a native speaker or a second language speaker or a third language even the third language speaker or where it stands in the you know um, in in the uh, list of how many people use it etc that is of course important but uh, when we talk about language, we just not we don't talk about numbers. We just to talk about statistics here. Okay, we also talk about some very important cultural um, cultural issues, right? And these cultural issues here, some of these are if you look at this list here, some of these are the study, of course, of the history of uh, the English language. Now, when you talk about the history of the English language, you are not simply chronicling. Okay, there's a difference between chronicling and writing history. We are not talking only about dates like old English, middle English uh, etcetera. We are within the study of the history of the English language. We need to talk about uh, many important changes that came about okay? and not only because of events like wars for instance okay? or marauding tribes for instance, but also uh, every, you know uh, as the Marxist critic Raymond Williams would put it. The everyday use and the variation in everyday use and the changes therein, okay, or uh, you know, owing to owing to uh, category, social category, strat stratification categories like class, for instance, right? So how how has the English language changed for different classes over the years? So see the what we want you to realize is that they are they are these are these very more sophisticated and nuanced ways of looking into variation okay even when you talk about the history of a language then the use of uh, you know the english language in diasporas in diasporic communities for instance okay people uh, who migrate uh, to other countries native speakers who migrate to other countries and also uh, speakers whose first language is not English who migrate to English speaking uh, countries like say the U uh, United States or the United Kingdom. Okay. What, what happens to the English language in these diasporic communities you know in a both two way immigration. 
uh, variations again of course, uh, variations with regard to gender, various variations with regard to as is mentioned earlier class, variations with regard to race for instance. Okay. Uh, um, these are also some areas that will that uh, one looks into scholars look into when they talk about the English language, acculturation how people you know how the, the language okay, undergoes, undergoes acculturation in different parts of the world. Right. So, when, a la when the language is used for instance, um, uh, they we have a separate uh, lecture on English in India, uh, we are going to talk about that in this issue in more detail. How has English changed in India for instance? Okay. So, how has the language acculturated itself in a different country? Then issues very important issues of creativity. Right. We talk uh, creativity in the in English language, what is considered sort of correctly creative? Uh, in uh, the you know the uh, in in um, earlier times n need not be so we see for instance in India you see the use or uh, the creative use on almost a deliberate breaking of rules uh, you know uh, in syntax in uh, in vocabulary in the usage of words for instance um, Arundhati Roy's uh, the God of Small Things is a book that you may you may want to look at when you think about how uh, you know creativity how the English language is sort of uh, used uh, and experimented upon syntactically and vocabulary wise. Okay. And uh, if not the most important word here is it is actually it is indeed one of the things that we need to look at and I would not say right at your uh, you know stage, but later on you, you should be aware that people look at the at languages in you know in general in the, and at the English language uh, in terms of ideology, in terms of what we call world view. Okay. Uh, what sort of world view um, comes about once you begin to use English language? You know there are, are um, there have been critics for instance the very famous duo linguist duo uh, Benjamin Horf and Edward Sapir. Let me write down Worf and Sapir. Okay. Now, we this is called the Sapir Hof um, uh, 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 hypothesis, right? Uh, this hypothesis was sort of at a low uh, in a you know in in I would say uh, probably around the 80s or 90s. But then one sees a coming back of this uh, hypothesis, particularly in the wake of new cognitive studies of language, and uh, they they their theory their theory or their hypothesis was that the language you use the language that you use every day determines your thinking. Okay. This is a huge thing to say really if you look at it is an enormous thing to say if you look at it the language that you use determines your world view. Right. So, we will stay with this and of course, you will uh, for something as huge as this you will understand there are two sides to the debate many scholars say that no language is just a tool of communication you want to say something and you know the world view this is the same all over the world you know as a human species right. So, you feel love, you feel hatred, uh, you feel cold, you feel warm, you just use another language to express it right. But others say scholars say that uh, following Sapirhoff, they say that no the language that you use is also going to determine the kind of uh, uh, thinking that you have. Okay. So, we will this is just to give you an idea of you know the different ways we can talk about the English language not just facts, not just statistics okay? and how we can analyze, critique and understand uh, the English language and this applies to all languages really. Okay? I am just trying to show you the scope of how one would uh, you know the scope of knowing the English language. Okay? History, diasporas, um, variations, acculturation, creativity, ideology etcetera are the ways in which you can study the English language. Then, after that also there are other areas not uh, less important these are uh, the ones that are being looked at m more frequently if I may say by by scholars um, particularly we talk about ideology for instance uh, the issue of resisting a language okay the issue of um, or the phenomenon if I may use the word of uh, people consciously trying to resist uh, the structures of the English language or any language for the matter resisting the structures of the English language. And on the other hand also trying to restore revive 
you know the so called vernacular languages, uh, the, the native languages okay, for in India for instance, Hindi or say Bangla or um, even Hindustani for instance, okay, the, the uh, different language movements that you are talking about, that is also a very important issue of, of understanding an, uh, a language. Reworkings of, reworkings of standard, the so called standard uh, English. Okay, and the acceptance of these reworkings of standard English, then restoring languages as I said could be restoring uh, both vernacular languages and also your own creative use or political use of the English language and of course, issues of modernity concerned with the English language. Okay. So, you can see how from the beginning of our lecture, we have moved from say what are the dialects that went into uh, the building of English, uh, same English be belongs to West Germanic, which again belongs to the Indo-European group etcetera. We talked about how you know these statistics and now we are talking about certain issues and what in the rest of the, uh, the lecture what I am going to do is I am going to bring to you certain uh, uh, you know uh, certain say comments, critical insights on these very areas that I have pointed out to you regarding the English language. First, let us look at what Raymond Williams said and I mentioned the text here right in the beginning when he talked about the texts and references uh, and I am reading from Raymond Williams here. In the general history of language, we can see two look at this two quite oppos opposite tendencies okay? an extraordinary evolution of separate languages and a remarkable growth in certain conditions of common languages. I mean, look at almost look at it as like a scientific phenomenon. Okay. So, he talks about the presence of opposite tendencies in any language and here is talking about the English language and it applies to the English language as well. We find that there is really a push and pull. Okay. There is he uses the word extraordinary evolution. There is the tendency for new languages to form okay, of separate languages that is the term he uses of separate languages to be formed. Okay. And at the same time, there is also okay, a phenomenal growth of in, in given certain conditions of common languages. So, it seems uh, you know to be a tendency in uh, language as a phenomenon in general okay. and of course, says so much about us as you know uh, as users of language the human species as the users of languages for communication. Okay. So, remember this also as he mentions it here in general it applies to the English language is even for the English language is a tendency for the separate you know uh, growth of separate languages. I mean you may say dialects, but nowadays uh, one the word dialect is also very politically charged and what, what would you call a dialect? Why would you call one language a dialect? and another language a language. Okay. Why would you give dialect a lesser um, sort of stature or status compared to a language? So, we are using the word languages here. So, there is a tendency for uh, separate languages to grow and also tendency for languages you know uh, of common languages. Okay. So, it seems to be uh, part of the human, um, uh, human, human condition of uh, as far as communication is concerned. Okay. Next is MacArthur, whose text is also mentioned in the, the references list. In the closing years of the 20th century, this is MacArthur talking about the English language. Okay. In the closing years of the 20th century, the English language has become a global resource. Right. As such, it does not owe its existence or the protection of its essence to any one nation or group. Right. So, it, uh, it has moved on in such a way as for it to be almost a global resource and you know the, the sort of the job of protecting the English language, the job of ensuring that the English language does not die out like you know and as you know uh, you are aware there is a apparently a phenomenal rate of the death of languages. Okay there are dead languages and there are dying languages in the world. If a community stops using a certain language and that is the anxiety of so many people okay, regarding uh, you know one's language. If you stop using your language eventually it would be a dead language. right? But in the case of English he says that it is such a global resource and I am sure particular in particular not just to academics also 
with regard to the internet, with regard to business, the international business, trade, etcetera. Okay. So, uh, it does not, as it says here, it does not owe its existence or the protection of its essence to any one nation or group. That is, several nations or countries in the world are ensuring that this language lives. Inasmuch as a particular language belongs to any individual or community, English is the possession, look at this the way he puts it. English is the possession of every individual and every community that in any way uses it, regardless of what any other individual or community may think or feel about the matter. And of course, many critics would you know particularly when you, when you talk about ideology you know, talk uh, from political purposes, uh, this kind of quotation or this kind of will, uh, will comment on the English language will not go down well in many quarters. Um, it may not go down so well with me here even as I am quoting this, but from one perspective MacArthur is not totally wrong. Okay. If you see the use of uh, you know uh, the English language, um, if you see the way it is being used as particularly in business and the internet, then of course, you know you would have to agree to what he is saying that the, the language is you know there is no custodian one, uh, England is no longer the custodian of the English language. The fact that the English language lives on and thrives is also due to people like say for here people in the third world the country like India uh, talking to you in English about the English language. right? So, it is it says English is the possession of every individual and every community that uses it in whatever way. Okay? Even you know even if that individual or community may have may think otherwise politically ideologically about the English language. Look at this as it says here, English is the possession of every individual and every community that in any way uses it, regardless of what any other individual or community or even people within that community may think or feel about this matter of English being used, uh, you know, or English being a global resource. Okay? Now, I would like to draw your attention to a, a, a short fragment from this is from a poem by um, uh, a writer uh, by a poet uh, named Kamla Das and uh, uh, for me really since I first read this poem this has really remained with me that's, you know it strikes me even as I read it again okay is how how uh, how perfectly she puts across this view of using a language that is not one's own. Right? This also bears upon what Tom MacArthur for instance uh, says about the language being you know uh, uh, used by a person and being uh, sort of being kept alive by that person. Uh, Kamla Das also adds another angle to it or the more sophisticated or more you know a complex angle to it. Now, let me read from this poem. I speak three languages as she, uh, she Kamla Das belong to Kerala, the, the state of Kerala in uh, India and her mother tongue was uh, Malayalam. So, she says I speak three languages, write in two, dream in one. Okay, this, this is the, he is talking about the, you know, the, 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 con, the situation of a person okay, who uses several languages. Look at this, I speak three languages, write in two and dream in one. I am sure dream in one is the his her own language that is her mother tongue. Okay. So, I speak three languages, write in two, dream in one. The language I speak becomes mine, this is very important. The language I speak becomes mine, its distortions, its queernesses all mine, mine alone. It is half English, half Indian, funny perhaps but it is honest. You see how, how a language which is not your mother tongue okay, is used by it is half English, half Indian, funny perhaps, but it is honest. This is the language that I use. My pronunciation may not be right. Okay. I may not know everything. I may not know many words in uh, the English language. Okay. I may uh, use my own mother tongue even when I speak 
uh, you know in English, I may put in a few words from my mother tongue, but it uh, it is an honest language. Okay, I use it, it is an honest language. So, it is half English, half Indian, funny perhaps, but it is honest. It is as human as I am human, do not you see, right? It voices my joys, my longings, my hopes. And here is somebody who writes also in the English language and is, you know, it, what strikes me here is so straightforward about it. So, again, it is so quote unquote honest about it, okay. A language that has been adopted for, for whatever socio cultural political historical reasons and it is as she says this language is mine. It may be funny, it may be half English, half Indian, but it is as human and it voices this is very important. It voices it is able to communicate my joys, my longings and my hopes. Okay. Next uh, says Simeon Potter is what uh, this is what uh, he has you know what we gain from from one of his extracts and I am reading this out. We cannot know too much about the language we speak every day of our lives. Most of us it is true can get along fairly well without knowing very much about our language and without ever taking the trouble to open a volume of the Oxford English Dictionary. But knowledge is power. The power of rightly this is important the power of rightly chosen words is very great whether those words are intended to inform to entertain or to move. Then he talks about English, English is rapidly becoming a cosmopolitan means of communication. Again look at what Tom MacArthur says a global resource okay? it is no longer one language belonging to a particular country. Okay? It is now a global resource. It is in Simeon Potter's words a cosmopolitan okay, means of communication and then he says let us read on. English is rapidly becoming a cosmopolitan means of communication and it is now being studied by numerous well trained investigators on both sides of the Atlantic. Okay? English is commented upon by people by academicians all you know uh, all, all over the world almost all over the world okay where we study and teach in english and this is not just a reserve okay these these critics potter macarthur for instance are even my, you know the poet kamla dasa say, saying that this is the language that is not is no longer anyone's uh, preserve right <coughs> it's a it's cosmopolitan it's become a global resource then again Coming to Raymond Williams, remember we had talked about variation, uh, the growth of standard English and standard English really highlighted here quote unquote okay, problematized here of course. Raymond Williams in his essay on the growth of standard English says the importance of speech as an indicator of social class. So, one is also to be aware of you know uh, of speech or say the English language that is used uh, speech as a marker or indicator of one's social class, so important in in uh, uh, you know uh, sociolinguistic studies uh, of the use of the language, not only in England, uh, but also in in even for even in India, for instance. Okay, the words vocabulary that is used that can differentiate class variation. The importance of speech as an indicator of social class is not likely to be underestimated by anyone who has lived in England. Class names such as base, villain kind, noble, proud, dangerous, etcetera. Okay. So, uh, you can go to his uh, you know this essay I think is in Indrani Ghosh's uh, edited volume. Okay. So, also uh, uh, talking about uh, you know first we talked about English as a global resource and how it is used. Now, next another aspect of it is the class variation that social class variation that the use of words, phrases even of tone punctuation that sort of uh, indicates one's class position is also something that is an important part of the English language of English of studying English language. Then we move on to George Orwell as you know George Orwell is one of the finest of novelists um, and this is what Orwell says about the English language okay? the, and I am reading out from his essay the English language has two outstanding characteristics to which most of its minor oddities can be finally traced. Now, look at this, these are the very important, these characteristics are English has a very large vocabulary, 
at this moment I cannot tell you the number of words really in uh, the Oxford English Dictionary, but uh, we know that English has a very large vocabulary and second simplicity of grammar. Okay, particularly later on we are going to look at uh, you know um, <coughs> the pruning of inflections for instance. Okay. So, th these are the two characteristics of the English language pointed out by George Orwell. What is what are these? A uh, of large vocabulary and B simplicity of grammar. English he says is really two languages Anglo Saxon and Norman French. This very you know this, this sentence really uh, talks about the you know what we talked about a while ago the incorporation of or the you know the effect the impact of languages uh, or of other languages other than uh, you know uh, other than English that is uh, no, I am sorry uh, uh, you know the, the languages that went into the formation of English okay, and the impact of Anglo Saxon and Norman French. English grammar is simple, the language is almost completely uninflected, a peculiarity which marks it off from almost all languages west of China. To write or to or even to speak English is not a science, but an art. There are no reliable rules, this is important. There are no reliable rules. There is only the general principle that concrete words are better than abstract ones and that the shortest way of saying anything is always the best. So, this is classic Orwell here and we do not have much time really there is other slides that I had want you know I, uh, I would have liked to talk about. Maybe I will incorporate these in other lectures. I will quickly do you know a recap by way of a question answer sort of a session. That is if uh, you know what are the questions that may come if you have a you know text like this, um, this lecture in your in your exams for instance. So, first of all um, you will have a question like uh, a simple question like what is uh, you know which which language group does English belong to and then you know when you go to back to the slide you see we talk about West Germanic English being a branch of West Germanic and belongs to the Indo European group uh, the family okay, groups or group of languages and next you talk about the extent of the use of you know if you get a question like what are or what is the extent to which English is used. Okay. Uh, wa all over the world, what do the statistics say? Then you would say that in uh, you know um, there are over 600 million users of English as far as uh, English is used as a second language or a third language and then English there are in 104 countries okay, we have a substantial number of um, uh, native uh, spe uh, speakers of the English language etcetera and these are some of the statistics that you give. Then uh, another question would be uh, historically speaking what are the three, uh, three broad phases of the English language and these would be what? These are as you saw in the slides old English, okay, middle English and modern English also called by some early modern English. Right. Then uh, another question on, uh, would be uh, apart from the factual uh, you know uh, factual knowledge relating or statistical knowledge relating to the English language, what are the different ways in which one a scholar may want to talk about the English language? What are the different aspects that you may reflect upon as far uh, you know as any language is concerned and in particular the English language is concerned? Then these are the areas. Remember we talked about the history. Okay, and history not only as chronicling the history of the English language and there it includes you know uh, the socio economic political history of the English language and then one might may be interested in the di in, in what happens to the language and diasporic communities okay, in, in both kinds of immigration okay, one when, when a native speaker of English moves to another country which is which where English is not the first language and people who migrate to English speaking countries like the USA and the United Kingdom. Right. Then there are other areas like the creative use of language. Okay. So, one may want to look at what happens to English in, uh, in the creative what rules are broken so to speak, okay. what new ways new expressions words are put in. And there I had mentioned for instance the Indian writer, Indian English writer Arundhati Roy and uh, her uh, uh, novel. Uh, that won the Booker Prize and uh, God of Small Things. This is uh, this clear, uh, you know, 
one critic I think even went in to call it linguistic gymnastics, but this very uh, some beautiful and novel ways of using the language and then are also most importantly ideology. Okay. Uh, the ideology uh, is ideological and political uh, issues in the use of the English language. Right? Then uh, you may get a question of a longer question for instance, like um, <coughs> with the help of certain uh, comments and insights given by writers and critics, okay, bring out some of the aspects of the English language, um, uh, uh, of the English language that have to talk about uh, that are to are to deal with its use as a global resource. Okay. So, you could then take uh, the help of writers like Tom MacArthur for instance, who indeed use the term global resource okay, and uh, how uh, you know English is not the preserve the language uh, the English language is not the preserve not the preserve of any one country or one community. Uh, any individual or community may feel uh, no matter what he or she or it feels okay, about the English language, uh, there is no denying the fact that we have uh, you know we who speak in the language work so to speak in this language okay, have helped to keep it alive and even enhance it. Right? Then you talk uh, you may also refer to the poet Kamla Das and how she beautifully puts it. Okay, uh, that her English may be ha half English, her language may be half English, may be funny, it may be incomplete, but it is her own okay, and it is an honest expression, tool of expression of expressing what she calls her joys uh, and her feelings etcetera. Right? And then also another important issue of social class as pointed out by Raymond Williams. Now, you know uh, uh, and George Orwell's of course, uh, his way is very straightforward in this case pointing out of two characteristics of the English language one is its simplicity in grammar and the other is its enormous vocabulary right. So, these are some of you know the non kind of numerical and non statistical uses you know uh, sorry issues about the English language that one may talk about right. So, uh, we will stop here now and uh, there, there is the, a lot more to talk about this and as I said in the second module uh, we will be talk about talking about these really in a lot more detail and uh, the fact that this you know these lectures are not meant you know, also for you know students who are uh, say majoring in English and study you know like majorly studying uh, the English language. This is for us uh, for, for you students uh, who, who are in basically for students in engineering colleges who have to take say English 101 or you know or basic English course or even later on to talk about certain issues in uh, you know English language and literature. So, for them for you I think this it is important and uh, sometimes enough to be simply aware of these issues as we talk about uh, for instance the English language. Okay. Uh, thank you for now and we will see you in the next lecture. <music>